Thank you, sir. Uh, we will start, sir, Basin, sir. Uh, uh, good evening and welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us today in CMY monthly lecture on outcome of HTW10 and the next step in the comprehensive review of 1978 STCW. Let us take a moment and let me mention the esteemed panelist and moderator. We have today Captain C.L. Dubey, Fellow and Warden. We have Captain Arvind Nadrajan, CMI member, AFNI. We have Mr. Sunil Kumar, CTO and Head of Training of JESCO. And we also have Captain Mahesh Yadav, who will be moderating the session. I will welcome Chairman Captain M.P. Basin, the opening remarks. Basin, sir. Thank you, Captain Sati Kumar, sir. Uh, indeed, a very, a very comprehensive uh, lecture meet that we all are looking forward to, especially in the view of the recently conducted STG, STW10 in UK. And... Uh, all the panelists uh, and speakers today have attended it. Captain Dubey, sir, attended on behalf of CMI. Arvind was attending on behalf of ICS and Sunil on behalf of IMEI. And we all are looking forward to look into this because the STCW convention change and the further STCW revision 2028, which we all are working. All these things are working towards that 2028. So, sir, I would like to rather say less and be a good listener to our expert speakers. And, of course, with our expert moderator, Captain Mahesh Yadav, sir. May all the best to everyone. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Basin, sir. Thank you very much. I will uh, take a moment uh, to introduce our esteemed uh, moderator, Captain Mahesh Yadav. Captain Mahesh Yadav is a first-class science graduate who did his pre -C training on training ship Rajendra 7576. He stood first in his batch. He served in SCI and also from cadet to master. He also obtained his extra master certificate in 1986. From 1989 to 97, he was deputed by SCI on training ship Rajendra Chanakya and LBS College. Thereafter, he worked in SA office. In 1999, he joined FOSMA as director. Maritime Education and Training, looking after all, all the training institutes of FOSMA, in addition to performing association functions. He is also the examiner for University of Mumbai for Mum BSc Nautical Science, host coordinator BSc Nautical Technology and Distance Learning, and an external examiner for Masters and Maids. He participated 
in all IMO HCC revision meetings from 2007 to 2010 and was the chairman of HCC 210 implementation committee appointed by DGS. He also conducted regional seminars on familiarization of Manila amendments to the SEC convention at Mombasa for African countries. He was awarded the National Maritime Day for outstanding contribution to maritime education and training. Over to you, sir, for introducing, moderating and taking up the Q&A session, sir. Okay, thank you, Captain Sashi Kumar, uh, for the introduction. Uh, we will begin with uh, Captain Arvind Natarajan. Uh, he started his career in 1995 and progressed towards taking command of uh, oil and chemical tankers in 2007. In 2015, he relocated in the UK to deliver STCW competency and modular courses at the University of uh, Suffolk. Uh, after this, he was employed with the UK Maritime and Coast Guard Agency as a Port State Control and Flag Administration Inspector. For the past two years, he has worked with the International Chamber of Shipping. In his role, he represents ship owners' interests at IMO's Maritime Safety Committee and Marine Environment Protection Committee meetings, as well as Human Element Training and Watchkeeping, NCSR, DPR subcommittee, etc. Due to his experience, he also leads on all operational issues involving oil chemical and gas tankers. So, so he is registered with several technical and expert groups at IAM. One of his most important projects is to lead the comprehensive review of STCW Convention and board on behalf of nearly 80% of the world ship owners that the uh, ICS represents. May I invite uh, Captain Arvind Natarajan to please uh, uh, give an overview uh, to his presentation. Uh, thank you very much, sir, and uh, I hope my audio is clear. Uh, thank you for this uh, opportunity, and in fact, uh, it is an it is a great honor for me Indeed. to be presenting with uh, all the stalwarts here. Uh, I just noted that uh, when Captain Mahesh Adho started his uh, career, I was not yet in existence. So this is really, really a very uh, humbling experience uh, for me. Uh, with your permission, may I just share a presentation? Uh, just a moment. Uh, can you please let me know when you can uh, view this presentation? Yes, it's okay. Right. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Sir. So uh, my intention today is to speak about uh, a few key outcomes from the 10th session of the Subcommittee on Human Element Training and Watchkeeping. Uh, and, and the next steps in the comprehensive review. So the HGW subcommittee is doing a very important work. The HGCW convention was last reviewed in 2010 and uh, the expected new HGCW convention will be in 2028. Uh, and, and probably this, the new HGCW convention has to be fit for purpose until 2050. So we have a, a challenge in our hands because there are there are so many technological social developments that are taking place. So uh, that's one of the biggest uh, challenges which the IMO uh, is facing and, and which I am leading on behalf of uh, on on behalf of nearly eighty percent of the world's uh, ship owners. So uh, <clears throat> before I go ahead, uh, just a brief uh, introduction about myself. Uh, I'm employed uh, with the International Chamber of Shipping as a senior marine advisor. Uh, earlier, I had a career on oil and chemical tankers. I, I was a master mariner uh, from 2007 until 2015 on, on these ships. Uh, after that, I had roles in academia. I was a lecturer at the University of Suffolk. And I was also a port state control and, and flag state uh, inspector with uh, the UK Maritime and Coast Guard Agency. Uh, to tell you something about my employer, uh, 
International Chamber of Shipping is the global trade association for ship owners and ship operators. Uh, our membership is through national ship owners associations. Uh, we have members in, in more than 40 countries around the world. And in terms of gross tonnage, we represent more than 80% of the world's merchant fleet. Uh, ICS was established in 1921. We celebrated our centenary two years ago. And, and we uh, ICS was the first organization to have consultative status uh, at IMO, which was in 1961. Uh, <clears throat> to, to tell you, come, come to the main uh, part of the presentation. Uh, what I'm going to speak now is about three very uh, important decisions that were taken at HCW 10 related to uh, the comprehensive review. <clears throat> yeah, uh, the first decision that was taken was uh, a list of specific areas uh, have been identified and finalized for the review. Now, this list of areas, altogether, there are 22 areas. And uh, these areas were discussed by correspondence uh, uh, throughout uh, 2023. And uh, finally, these 22 areas, some of them, I have uh, shown them on the screen. Uh, they, they are emerging technologies, digital, digitalization of documents, and, and, and many others. Overall, uh, if you look at these 22 areas, altogether, they cover the entire convention and code. So I am hopeful that uh, this review of the STCW convention is going to indeed be comprehensive. It will start from page one of the convention until the, la until the final uh, page. Uh, one very, very important decision that was agreed was that the articles of the convention will also be under review. Uh, the articles of the STCW convention were drafted in 1978, and they have never been reviewed since then. Uh, there have been many technological advances since then, and uh, I think that uh, some of the articles definitely need to be reviewed uh, and perhaps be revised. Uh, one example of this would be that uh, currently the article uh, in the STCW convention specifies that the convention is only for seafarers working on board ships. So if you consider that we have got uh, autonomous ships technology coming into uh, coming very soon and and there will be autonomous operators what should be the competency of these people should it be within the stcw convention or outside so these are some of the things that need to be discussed so uh, so i think it was a very good decision that the articles of the convention are also going to be uh, included within the review uh, Broadly, some of the some of the review areas I have mentioned here, but there are 22 areas, and and uh, on request I can also uh, forward all these uh, areas to, to to all of you. The next decision that was made at HGW10 was to decide on the methodology of the comprehensive review. Uh, the methodology was something which ICS had proposed. Uh, in HTW6, which was four years back. Uh, and what we had proposed is that the comprehensive review should follow two stages. The first stage should be a complete review of the convention and code. And we have to decide upon the review areas. And then the next step would be a targeted revision only specifically of areas which have been decided that a revision is required. So uh, to elaborate more upon this, the first stage, which will start later this year, will be a comprehensive review. So delegations, uh, in, in, including the Indian administration or, or, or uh, any interested parties, will submit proposals for an area which they feel needs to be reviewed. The intersessional working group will discuss the merit of the proposal, whether indeed that area needs to be reviewed. And uh, these proposals have to be made as per a specific uh, template. Uh, and once that is done, 
if it is decided that the area has to be reviewed, then that proposal will go to the next stage, which is the revision stage. And in the revision stage, uh, it is going to be a targeted revision. Uh, and in the targeted revision, only specific proposals for revising the areas which have been decided in the first stage will be uh, entertained. So delegations will submit specific revision proposals. HGW subcommittee will, will discuss the merits of the proposals, whether a particular uh, regulation or a particular table needs to be revised or added upon, or perhaps some competencies have to be deleted. Uh, once, once the revisions have been agreed upon, uh, and uh, once been agreed upon, the adoption and entry into force will be decided uh, after that. But it is expected that, uh, that the entry into force will be in uh, 2028. So this is the planned uh, uh, roadmap. Uh, speaking of the roadmap, uh, sorry, uh, about the methodology, something more. Uh, just for your information, uh, there is uh, some discussion about an intersessional working group to be held this year uh, within the second or third week of October. And this will be the starting of the first stage of the comprehensive, uh, of the comprehensive review. Uh, and I, on behalf of ICS, I am discussing with the IMO Secretariat uh, about finalizing a template which member states uh, will use to submit proposals for review stage. So the discussion is still in progress, but uh, I, I, I think that we should conclude a final template, which will be disseminated to all uh, member states uh, by the end of uh, next week. Uh, speaking of the roadmap, uh, now please remember that this roadmap is 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 only uh, it's only a draft roadmap. So some of the things to to understand in this roadmap is that the end date. Uh, of the adoption of the SGCW convention is uh, expected to be in autumn of 2027. Uh, personally, I feel that this is very, very optimistic. There is quite a possibility that uh, this may be severely delayed, especially if articles need to be amended, because amendment of articles will come into force by explicit acceptance rather than tacit acceptance. Uh, <clears throat> The other thing is that the phase one of the review will uh, will continue from uh, the intersessional working group, which is expected in October uh, for one year until, 2000, until the end of 2025. Uh, and then that will be followed by the second phase, which is the revision stage. Uh, there is also a recommendation to hold at least three in-person with hybrid facility uh, intersessional working groups. So I think that this is a, a very good decision because this will speed up the, the, the process of the comprehensive yeah. review and, and, and revision. And, and finally, yeah. the final session uh, is expected to be uh, either it will be an SGW session or it will be a special diplomatic conference uh, that was held, for example, last time in, in Manila, which is why we call it the Manila Amendments. So there will be a diplomatic conference yeah for the final adoption of the new SJCW convention. So these are some of the decisions uh, that were made and, and the roadmap uh, that has been uh, finalized. <clears throat> uh, what is ICS uh, planning? So on behalf of ICS, uh, I have started a scoping exercise of the SJCW convention and code. Uh, and we are identifying specific review areas specific chapters, regulations, SGCW code tables, uh, which we feel need to be reviewed. And we are going to be submitting uh, proposals to the intersessional working group. Uh, and then uh, these, these proposals, of course, will be uh, submitted as per, the, uh, as per the format, as per the, the template, which was agreed at SGW 10 and which I'm developing with the IMO secretariat. Thank you. So this was uh, just a brief uh, overview of three very important decisions that were taken at uh, SCW 10. Thank you very much. And I'm uh, happy to uh, answer any questions. Thank you.
I think uh, after this uh, overview from Captain Arvind Natarajan, uh, you must have noticed one very specific point which is which seems to be missing somehow, and that is uh, yes, comprehensive review is going to take place. Beginning now, there will be two phases. First phase will identify what needs to be changed, and second thing will uh, uh, second phase will identify and describe what to change it to. So that's how this two phases have come in. Uh, there is one very important aspect which is uh, uh, you can say directly yet to be addressed is that uh, the requirement for the use and the safety precautions dealing with alternate fuels. And uh, you see in that entire thing, what is actually happening is that that particular aspect is moving far too fast as compared to the rate at which the STCW convention revision is taking place. And that is why, along with and in parallel with the comprehensive review of the STCW convention, what we have is the training safety requirements and the operational aspects of using alternate fuels. And that is what Mr. Sunil Kumar is actually going to address. And uh, that is coming in through the dictate from the MEPC and from the Maritime Safety Committee. And that work will continue in parallel without waiting for this review to complete and then start with the alternate fuel separate. Because already there are so many proposals which are in place dealing with the safety precautions to deal with different different types of alternate fuels, including I think the battery operated shifts and that's the latest one that I saw from China. So we have Mr. Sunil Kumar here, he's a maritime professional with over three decades of experience. He earned his marine engineering degree from DMIT in 1993, followed by a master's degree in mechanical engineering and later an MBA from IIT Bombay. Presently, Mr. Kumar holds the position of company training officer and head of training and assessment at the Great Eastern Shipping Company Limited. He is actively participated as a member of Indian delegation for maritime safety committee sessions and human element training and watchkeeping subcommittee sessions at IMO headquarters in London. He has been contributing to the, I don't like this word, shadow committees, means the ones who work behind the scenes who are not visible. And uh, probably the powers that we don't want to show them that who are these people who are working you know, behind the curtains. Also, uh, they address the shadow committees working on maritime safety committee and uh, human element training and watchkeeping at DG Shipping for IAM. Mr. Sunil Kumar is uh, serving as a member of technical committee at the Indian Register of Shipping and DNB. is also a member of research and training committee of the Inter Indian National Ship Owners Association. He has been invited to speak at industry forums and events organized by entities such as the Ministry of Environment, uh, Forest and Climate Change, Indian Register of Shipping, LNT Shipyard, Company of Master Mariners and Institute of Marine Engineers. He holds the status of Chartered Engineer with the Institution of Engineers and is recognized as a fellow of Institute of Marine Engineers. His professional journey includes <laughs> Roles as past vice president and chief technical officer at Goal Offshore Limited and directorship at DWS Offshore Services Limited and KEI or SOS Maritime Limited India. He has previous experience as a maritime surveyor and auditor with DNV and as a chief engineer in the tanker fleet of British Shipping Company. Mr. Sunil Kumar, we welcome you at the company of Mark Sangha and Black Thank you. Thank you, um, Captain Yadav. Uh, thanks for the introduction. So, as uh, Captain Yadav was mentioning, uh, my in deliberation is limited to <laughs> for the operating uh, currency. 
Is, is it worth it? Is it worth it? The online audience, I'm not sure yeah. what they're seeing. But Oh, see what it no, we, we can see it. We can see it very clear. Thank you. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you so much. So uh, my deliberations are uh, focused on uh, training related to alternative fuel, and it was observed during the sessions that if we are going with comprehensive review of uh, STCW, by the time we are ready. Uh, with everything, it will be maybe one more decade gone. And alternative fuel is like right there. You will see some data. So, yeah, this is me. Um, so, Indian delegation who was there in February, the, the, the picture of that with the top people over there. Mr. Pandurang was leading the Indian delegation, Captain Debu was there, I myself, he was particularly present. Mr. Senthil Kumar, Mr. Ravi Singh, Captain Yadav, Captain Dubey, Captain Philip Matthew, Captain Sweet Kumar, Fantas, they were there available online in virtual mode uh, during this Indian delegation at AW 10. So, overview of course, uh, we heard uh, Captain Vitrajan, he has given the complete detail. Uh, of course, safety of the seafarer was the major focus uh, during HTW 10 discussions. Like, whatever we do, whatever we decide, keeping safety in mind <clears throat> was the key thing which was highlighted by Mr. Arsenio during his uh, <coughs> lecture or during his opening remark. Uh, coming to the why we are talking about alternative fuel as uh, separate key. So, you, if you analyze the global ship order position, you will understand why it is so serious. So, a recent analysis of global ship orders for 2023 revealed an increased role of alternative fuel propulsion with a total of 298 ships ordered with alternative fuel propulsion an 8% increase year on year. So this is where the seriousness comes in. If you see the methanol and LNG were neck and neck with 138 and 130 orders respectively. But 2023 marked a breakout year for ammonia with 11 such vessels ordered, ammonia vessels. Container ships and car carriers accounted for the biggest share for alternative fuel vessel orders. So most of the vessels which are on order book with alternative fuel are mostly container ships and car carriers. 49% of new building orders by way of, not numbers, by way of gross tonnage, they were for alternative fuel propulsion in 2023. In 2022, it was 55%. Although it is little lesser in number 2023, but overall from previous years, it is still quite as an increase in number. In 2022, 39.9% of the total order book was set to use LNG, 3.5% methanol, 2.1% LPG, and 2.4% capable of using other alternative fuels. So basically, LNG. Methanol, LPG, these were the alternative fuel which were higher in numbers when it came to ordering new village. Future optionality remain a priority, like enabled, like uh, later on you can put ammonia uh, or uh, methanol, like the vessels are getting ordered, but for some time you will use uh, fuel which is currently available in the market but enabled to use those alternatives. So those kind of vessels are also on future ready vessels. Despite headline grabbing orders, the current order book trajectory may only deliver one-fifth of the vessels needed to achieve IMO 2030 target for alternative fuel uptake. So this is the scenario. But why? I'm coming back to the training because this is our area. STW is all about 
human element training and watch training. So we let's understand why training on alternative fuel is vital. Why we are talking about alternative fuel separately. What is there in alternative fuel? Fuel should not be so much in high that we have to think the training on alternative fuel separately. What is the reason for that? That let's understand some basics so that we are very clear that why it is necessary. If the, those fundamentals are clear, as training institutes, as training uh, organizations, we will be setting up better targets. We will be setting up better uh, goals for to deliver what a seafarer would require for their safety. So risk of fire and explosion, alternative fuel may have different combustion characteristics compared to traditional fuel. Some alternative fuels such as LNG or hydrogen are highly flammable and can pose a higher risk of fire or explosives if not handled properly. So this is one area of consideration. Handling and storage challenges. Alternative fuels often require special handling and storage facilities. For instance, LNG need to be stored at extremely low temperature. Hydrogen needs a very high storage area. So these alternative fuels are coming with its own challenges. And hence, we have to think of specialized training. Compatibility and stability issues. We all know uh, the compatibility issue when we switched over from the same grade but lesser sulfur. Just by that, we saw the issues were popping up. Engines, seizure, failures, but so many numbers. Unless we are keeping our seafarers well trained, well groomed to handle such alternative fuel, we are going to have series of failures, series of breakdowns. And each breakdown, how much does it cost to the owner? One part, safety risk, <clears throat> another part. Like both ways we are going to be roll drums if we have not trained our seafarers on alternative fuel. That's obvious. Operational challenges. Of course, we are talking about engine performance, fuel consumption, emergencies related to the newer fuel. All those things have to be taken into account when we are designing the training for our seafarers. The content should cover all these challenges which I am highlighting right now. Emergency response preparedness. This is one area again. Uh, we have to fuel wise for each fuel, we have to have the plan, the emergency preparedness plan. Like, if in case any mishap happens or some disaster is bound to happen, what will be the emergency response? So, each fuel has to be discussed in detail and understand the those parameters which I have just mentioned for each fuel, this is a, in fact uh, in November last year, I had given one presentation on fuel safety for 11 uh, grades of fuel, which was like which is in uh, like being talked about and being considered for users on the ships. Technological uncertainties, of course, these fuel require a special kind of engine to be burned. So, people need to be trained on those engines and not the conventional engine. And you know, again, from uh, MC engine to ME, when we switched over, uh, the engineers were to be trained on a very, in a big way. Uh, and it's, it's still on. Right? That was not a very major shift from a camp in. Now we are talking about burning alternative fuel, which is going to be like a mega shift. So, technological uncertainties. Now, all those challenges. I mean, imagine our current set of seafarers who are used to uh, these conventional fuels. Suddenly, now. You're bringing in alternative fuels. Name check, it's just one word, alternative fuel. But associated things are so big. We just saw the challenges. So, what developed in the uh, uh, at IMO during HTW? 
So it was proposed that work related to the development of training provisions for seafarers on the ships using alternative fuel should be separate from the work of comprehensive review of STCW conditions. So which was like with all this background, everybody was thoroughly convinced that we cannot deal everything together. The thing of on alternative fuel, the training requirements, etc., has to be brought in right away and much faster pace as compared to the comprehensive review of overall STCW. So it was a consensus on prioritizing the development of training provisions for seafarers in response to the decap of shipping, including including the use of alternative fuel and battery power. These are again alternative means. So there is one parallel uh, paper which was put by China on battery powered uh, ships, which we supported <laughs> because we felt that battery powered ship is another category where. We need to be focused on, and uh, of course, training related to that is another important aspect. ICS has put the proposal on uh, alternative fuel to be separated from like discussion on alternative fuel should be done uh, in a manner which is much more, uh, has to be done much more speed than a comprehensive review which is going on for so many years. So MSD, Triple C, and all this committee, along with uh, Maritime Just Transition Task Force, uh, basically, is the idea is to have a coordination among all these bodies in a manner that there is no duplication of work. Idea is that they have to bring their proposals in a coherent manner, and there is no duplication. The same on on the same project, same. Or uh, fuel, everybody is working uh, in a parallel. Right? And you are coming up with uh, one thing is very solidly really done, and another thing is left out because we are not working in coordination with each other. So, uh, in STW 11, the, is, the agenda is. Proposed agenda is that uh, development of training provisions for seafarer on use of alternative fuel. That's going to be the main thing. Uh, again, considered use of all the relevant bodies who are working on it, MSC, CCC, and of course, just transition task force. Uh, so all these bodies have to work in coherence. So some challenges, I'll just highlight a few fuel grades, I mean, being technical in nature, little bit of understanding <coughs> that should be there. We keep talking about alternative fuel, but you have to understand the little bit of uh, technology or the science behind this fuel. So just I'll, I'll quickly touch upon the challenges with LNG, like its drawback is that it releases methane as natural gas. And within undergoes atmospheric reaction, which forms tropospheric ozone, among other substances. This ozone causes harm to the health and environment. We all know that. The bunkering process poses significant dangers. LNG bunkering is challenging to you know, that. Fire and explosion risk. Cryogenic freeze burns pose another significant hazard. Both metals and plastics are prone to embrittlement. Like the metal and plastic, when it comes in contact with LNG, it becomes brittle. It can easily break. Hazard associated with confined spaces, huge challenge with regard to fire exposure. So these are the challenges that has been compressed into one, one single page. Uh, of course, there are a lot of research has gone in. I'll just try to summarize everything in one single slide. But then the way forward is also needs to be visualized because other again we are designing the training content now for our seafarers. So we must know what are the challenges and what are the way forward. So I have picked a few fields only. I'll not take too much of time. Implementation and adherence to the IDF code regulation is a must. 
practical hands-on training needs to be adopted. Simulator to be extensively used for training purposes. Crew members need to become familiar with the procedures. Protective equipment should be compulsory and importance to emphasize during training. First aid competence development need to be enhanced. So these are the broad way forward for if you are uh, designing a module on LNG. Same thing, challenges with related to LPG. Eye irritation may cause from exposure to the vapors. If the liquid enters the eye, it can cause irritation and freezing. Skin contact with liquid may lead to irritation and frostburn. Inhalation of substance may cause irritation to the respiratory tract. And moderate exposure may result in headache and dizziness. Prolonged exposure can cause unconsciousness, breathing failure by reducing oxygen level, potentially acting on the tract. The substance has potential to affect the heart and nervous system. Again, fire and explosion goes with LPG. We know. Again, way forward, I have drafted, I will not read uh, the full thing again. So, major focus has to be simulator based training, hands on training, training on PPE project, uh, and training on first aid. So, these are the areas where we have to really be focused on when we are. Uh, designing and developing the content for same thing goes with methanol to quite toxic can cause birth defect so seafarers have to be made aware that what are the <clears throat> these issues that they are going to face the it's not to uh, scare them it is to make them aware more they are alert safer are going to be our ships <clears throat> so this is on methanol same thing i have Drafted and recorded on lithium ion battery, not so popular, but yes, the challenges are way forward. I have listed down. Okay. I'll share all these uh, with uh, CMI and maybe we can do it for circulation also. It seems we should apply the same thing to ammonia, hydrogen, another risky proposition. Uh, but then we are aware now. Uh, that these alternative fuel are coming with lots and lots of challenges. But the way forward has also, see, I am part of um, the correspondence group who is working on safety related to alternative fuel. Uh, and we will be presenting a paper between this MSC 108. So, one 40 countries were there involved in this correspondence group. And uh, about, like since last uh, MSC, that was May 2023, till now we have been submitting papers, plenty of papers have gone. And these are probably the impacts, most of it from there. So, all this will be debated and discussed during this upcoming in the month of May, uh, MSC 108. All this will be, third where will be discussed, technicality will be discussed. And something will come back to STW 11 from there, whatever is out that is discussed in MSC 108 will become part of discussion for <laughs> STW 11. So, in conclusion, the critical importance of training on alternative fuel in maritime sector has been explored. Seafarers play a vital role in transition and must be empowered with the necessary knowledge and skills. This is what I was trying to say that seafarers have to be kept in focus. <laughs> They cannot be kept aside and thought of alternative fuel just because some alternative fuel comes cheaper and we are putting them on board. Their safety aspects have to be taken into account, even if it is a costly uh, alternative fuel. But if safety is more prevalent on that fuel, that has to be given a priority. Each of us has a role to play in advancing the transition to alternative fuel, whether through advocacy, education, innovation, or collaboration. Let's commit ourselves to continuous learning, resilience, action for cleaner, safer, and more sustainable <coughs> maritime industry. With that, I conclude my session. Thank you so much. Any questions to be asked now or later? I will ask uh, next week or anything. Thank you.
After having dealt with the overview of the comprehensive revision and uh, the use and the safety requirements for the alternate fuels, uh, there are two, three more topics in the which were dealt with in the human element training and uh, certification and was keeping uh, subcommittee meeting. And they are basic issues primarily. One of them is the status and uh, revision of the IMO model courses. Uh, because some courses uh, are pretty outdated as early as the year 2000. So what is their status now and what is happening about all the you know, the various revisions which are required to be along with the revision of the conventions in the model courses. And the second item is the digitalization process and dissemination of information from the member states to IMO and from IMO to the other member states. Uh, just to give an example, Indian Certificate of Competency is recognized by about 40 countries. Where is the list? From where do, does anybody find out which are these 40 countries which are recognizing Indian certificates? If a person with Indian certificate selling on a Panama flagship goes to Antwerp, how do the Antwerp authority know that Panama is recognizing Indian certificate? Where is that? At? India has an agreement with the uh, No, the five countries that we have here goes to voyages agreement with uh, Bangladesh, <laughs> Maldives, no, not Bimstek, so just a BIMS area, uh, Sri Lanka, Maldives, uh, <laughs> Myanmar, India, and uh, Bangladesh. So these are the five countries. So we have whereby the people holding near post to voyage certificates can go to the, the, no, the Near coastal voyages of the balance for countries and vice versa. But where is that list of these five countries available? Other than we just happen to know about. <laughs> Similarly, uh, just take another example of uh, whether we like it or not, that's a different issue. Whether we want it to be in place or not, that's another different issue. But we are not implemented what is known as dual or polyvalent certification except a very limited batch operated from NERI Mumbai for about a period of 4-5 years. Other than that, uh, neither at the officer's level nor at the ratings level, whether it is worth keeping rating or able see for a deck and Indian, we are not implemented that dual certification or polyvalent certification. But from where do I find out? To facilitate all that, there's something being created which Captain Dubai is going to explain. Uh, that is the module which is being created at uh, IMO. Captain CL Dubai is a graduate and master, joined Merchant Navy in 1972 and thus has more than 50 years experience in maritime industry and more than 30 years in maritime training. He presently heads Mumbai Maritime Training Institute as principal and owner. Is an excellent examiner in DG shipping, paper setter, and moderator in the MMD examinations. He was part of Indian delegation in 2023 and 2024 at IMO's STW 9th uh, and 10th session. He's written many nautical books like Advanced Ship Stability, Celestial Navigation, Chart Work for Deck Officers, and Maritime Legislation. Captain Dubai, please. <laughs> This one. This one, yes. Okay, uh, gentlemen, uh, first of all, uh, uh, I thank Seema Mai for uh, giving me an opportunity to be a part of Indian delegation uh, in 2023 time when I was in, uh, in uh, IMO, and this time online I attended it. Uh, the two topics which I want to talk about, uh, 
One of them is the GIS, GISIS, uh, Global Integrated uh, Shipping Services Information. So that is something uh, which is going to come up, is already agreed upon. So there will be a lot of information put on the IMO website. Countries can see that and verify uh, certain information. So this is the first thing I want to talk about. And after that, the status of modular courses. Uh, what has happened in modular courses in last uh, SDW 10? So these are the two topics we want to discuss about. Uh, this has been already explained by Captain Arvind Natarajan. About comprehensive revision of CCW, he has already taken up in detail. This Mr. Sunil Kumar has already taken up this topic. This is the one I want to talk about. Uh, that's a global integrated shipping information system. Uh, various regions, why it has come into being is about the Informations which are not available to various parties when they want to find out about uh, the states who have recognized certain certification, uh, their medical status, their certificate status, what you see they're having, all that is uh, was not available. So it is something which has been put on. Reports on unlawful like practical practices associated with the certificate of competency. Uh, during the discussion, the following views were expressed. Detected fraudulent certificates should be reported to issuing administration and information on parties, the certificates of which were recognized as the regulation IA Body 10 and the certificate verification. Facility should be incorporated in the SCCW GS. The GISIS module. STW 10 agreed to establish a new module in the IMO's online information database for a trial period of two years to make information on recognition of SCCW certificates and the certification facility available to all stakeholders. The initiative is a response to reports on Fraudulent SCW certificates and endorsements. Uh, further to that, the following uh, above decisions of the subcommittee and the committee substantial progress have been made in the development of SSL Blue GISIS module by the Secretariat. This model is expected to cover the following functionalities. SSL Blue focal points, initial communication of information, subsequent reports, 
list of competent persons will all be on the IMO website. Dispensations, fraudulent certificates, and simulators. So these are the informations which will be there on IMO website. Based on the above, it is recommended that the subcommittee consider requesting the Secretary to launch the new SIS module for a trial period of two years. The experience gained <coughs> would be submitted to subsequent sessions of the subcommittee with a view to providing useful input to the comprehensive review of the conventional course, in particular with regard to the enhancement of the uh, communication of information to be used. <laughs> so this is regarding the first part uh, that is this is module. It's already approved and uh, for two years it will be on and you know the feedback will be taken what improvement can be done on that module. Yeah. Now on the model courses, I'm a model courses. STW10 validated the following two model courses. Now, in this, uh, the Global Met reprinted you, uh, Captain Mola, he was in charge of this, uh, validating this uh, IMO model courses. 1.32 on operational use of integrated based systems, including integrated navigation. System, the commercial device, and 1.35 on liquefied petroleum gas, tank cargo, and barrel sending simulators. So these two things have been revised and revalidated, I mean validated and ready for uh, you know to put in the in the printed form and on you know digital form for people to use. Among the next model courses planned for validation is the model course 1.21, that's personal safety and social responsibility, which will incorporate the new competence, competences to prevent and respond to bullying and harassment in the maritime sector, including sexual assault. <coughs> this is something which we are already following in our system. It's already, uh, you know, this thought. Uh, but this will be coming in IMO model course 1.21. And then model course 1.37 on chemical tanker cargo and balance and simulator. And 2.06 on oil tanker cargo and balance and simulator. These two are also going to be revised. So this next session will take up these courses also for validation. Okay, so that's it, gentlemen. Uh, I had to talk about these two. This is module and uh, this uh, uh, I know model courses which have been revised and which are going to be revised in future. Thank you. So I think first we'll take the questions from the people who are present here and then we will uh, try and see if the questions which have come online from the other participants. Yes, please. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Can I please uh, introduce yourself briefly and uh, just the question state? Yeah. Okay, my name is uh, Catherine Kumar. Dr. Presently, I am working as a director of Criminal Marine Private Limited. I work with India Schoolship. I was the head of quality of India Schoolship, the head of quality of marine operation in Marlow Navigation. 
So my question is from uh, Mr. Sunil Kumar. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so this is regarding, as you said, uh, you are the part of, I mean, the study is being done for safety part of alternatives. You. Correct. So from where you are collecting the data, what type of, uh, I mean, uh, research or maybe the lab best, the data is being collected for the, I mean, what is the practical base or, or is it theoretical base? Okay. Uh, it is actually, uh, there are 40 countries who are participating and from India, there is no lab or no scientific body which is part of that. But the other nations, uh, they are having their institutions, which are the bodies which are into research. They are putting up their papers, the research that has gone in. So I am able to see what is what are the research that is happening in other developed countries and uh, we we need to do that we, so uh, during our shadow committee meetings uh, this is always been debated discussed but here the research on alternative food is i am not sure whether it is happening and if something is flowing to us at my time industry thank you thank you why India is so behind for having all these setup dates? Yeah, it's catching up. We are waiting for some developed country to give us the data and then we follow that. We have to review on that. So I think... We are... Actually, we have been behind, but now we are catching up. We are attending all the meetings happening at IMO in a big number. So soon we will see more things coming up as paper, we are inviting, encouraging people to present papers. And there are bodies like classification societies like IRS, TNV, LR. Through their research division, uh, some research paper comes to us. And, and those are also taken up. But uh, on this safety related to alternative field, uh, so far I have not seen any paper coming up from Thank you. Thank you. Yes. First of all, Captain Narkaz and what is he there? Can you check? Uh, very much, sir. Still awake. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, Captain Narkaz and in the oil and gas uh, sector, um, the ships that we know of LNG and uh, PG, they are getting converted into offshore installations of late, you know, last 10, 15 years. FSRU are coming, FLNG, <coughs> FPS already there. The role of master is getting merged into OIM. So from the SCCW angle, is there anything for OIMs or, or is left to some other uh, regulatory body? Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you for the question. So uh, what I feel is that in the SGCW convention, it clearly men mentions the scope. And the scope is for seafarers working on board ships uh, above a certain gross tons. Now, that ship, if it is employed as an as FSRU or if it's employed as a normal uh, a merchant ship uh, uh, for worldwide trade, the competencies are within SGCW. Specific competencies which are peculiar to a certain industry will not be addressed in STCW because the STCW is intended to be just the bare minimum and any top-up training for a peculiar kind of technology or a peculiar kind of trade, that has to be addressed outside uh, STCW. And typically this is done by, this is done by the employers. So, so, you know, many responsible employers, in addition to STCW training, provide that extra training. So that is how it is going to be addressed. It is uh, unlikely that uh, uh, it, this will be addressed within this uh, comprehensive review. And we also have to bear in mind that uh, the current competencies in STCW are just too much. Uh, and, and we cannot keep adding more and more competencies. So at some point, we will have to address some outdated competencies also. So uh, all I can say is that uh, competencies 
in relation to a peculiar trade will not be addressed in STCW. Thank you. Thank you. Can I ask one more question? So yes, yes. Yeah. Yes. So as you said, uh, the person from India selling on Panama flag went to yes. all the certificate reasons. So there is a permanent history of the board, chapter 1 of 10, that certificate will be recognized by the uh, contracting history, all other ones. So they have to have the panel certifications. They have certificate uh, from this flag. They are only taken. So the validity is there. There is the list which provides that these certificates are recognized by this particular flag. So once you are joining the vessel, for example, flag, no, no, no. For yeah. example, yeah. Uh, you take uh, example of any particular country. They give a flag state endorsement to a person with Indian certificate without having any recognition agreement without having anything else in place. <clears throat> How are you going to check it? Yeah, that is the fact that if somebody is that's what is that, happening. Yeah. That's what is happening. And there was a paper, there was a paper presented by Japan and some other countries along with that, highlighting these lacunas in the not only in the convention, but also the where is the facility available? How do I check whether it is actually genuine or not? And it's a fact of life. In today's date, Probably there are people who are selling on flags which have not actually recognized the certificate, but they are issuing the flag state endorsement left, right, and center. How do you verify that whether it is genuine? Not in terms of what has been issued, but whether do they have an agreement in place with that country concerned? I think, sir, nowadays uh, they have uh, some self particular I don't know, but uh, what I'm saying to know that now, where to go there, that they kind of issuing already, like, uh, like Panama is issuing already for the Indian for the, If they will check with the DGC bank, the certificate is valid or not, and then only they will issue that. They have some checking mechanism for that. I understand what you are saying. What you are not trying to gather is that if that Panama does not have an agreement with India, but if they issue the endorsement or uh, the, the recognition endorsement, how am I to check whether it is correct or not? There has to be a direct database available. The database is something which is not available. That is the problem. Actually, yeah, actually on the website of IMO or on the website of some administration. That is the correct place. That's, yes. that's why this is being that's uh, and is the logic. And the central place, instead of going to each and every country and trying to check what all they are doing and what all they are not doing, it all has to be available as a, you know, uh, just punch in a key and straight away you get that answer. And that should be from IMO rather than going to, uh, because you probably it's like, difficult to know the website address of various administrations as well. Something like being like having a white tape, you yeah. should have a list of countries, you know, yeah. having a list of countries, you know, no, I that is the main yeah, point. From the students' point of view, yes. the students uh, after the class, like page one and all, that I'm saying uh, mostly on the class carriers. Then why I have to learn about very personal and cargo? Why would not we have a excellent, excellent. It is very simple and straight. You don't have to learn anything about Indian purchase and so on and so forth, no nothing. If we are in a position to limit your certificate to that island ship or LP ship. So if you would say, like to do that, there is no problem. That limitation, that limitation provision is available. There is no real problem. We can deal with that. But the problem is nobody likes limitation on a certificate. Because today that LPG LNG is working, but then uh, Mr. Sunil Kumar is saying, well, this is going to get out. Now it's going to be taken over by something else. Mm -hmm. In that case, how does, where does he go with his LPG LNG certificate itself? So those type of ships which are not covered and under any specific uh, chapter 5 or whatever, dangerous cargo endorsement, DC, commonly what we call it, 
they are all in the so called general section and they are covered for everybody whether you have an endorsement or you don't have an endorsement now coming to the question of union purchase and other things there are not many outdated things lots of them have to be taken off gradually from the slippers as in when we get it is not related only to the ship type per se it is also to do with in general what all things that we have been dealing with with uh, Uh, I think there are many senior people here, but at least uh, last fifty years or forty years, we haven't ever uh, touched them or never ever used it. Yeah, so that's part of it. It's part of the convention revision itself, whereby it is saying outdated provisions or the list of competencies or the knowledge requirements which are given in the convention to be reviewed and decided whether to continue or not to continue. Yeah. Uh, so, 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 yes, yes. so uh, <laughs> regarding training for alternative fuels, there's no doubt about it. Training got to be there, but the focus seems to be only safeguarders. Like that's the solution to everything. What about the technology? You know, training follows technology. The first technology has to be in place. Is IMO involved in technology development of you know of alternate fuels? Uh, bunkering, storage, uh, treatment, uh, and uh, uh, of course uh, injection into the engines. I see. Which may I am okay? Yeah, they are all solved for class. Yeah, so I am is into the regulatory framework. So yeah, so if class is taking the technology, then class is the one who will be probably the better one to yes. decide what should be the training. Correct. So uh, as I said. IMO has limitation on regulatory framework. They will decide keeping safety of the seafarers in mind, as Mr. Arshini mm -hmm. mentioned. So that is what they will take care of. But technology supporting everything, uh, that part uh, will come up as a proposal from the makers of those equipment, those technology. Because there will be again a competition. I make better products than you. Kind of those scenario is already prevailing. Lobbying and all that. Yeah. Where I'm so getting the, at, sorry, yeah. to interrupt. Where I'm getting at is seafarers are at the yes, you know, back right. end. All the mess up has been done in the design stage, and yeah. now we are supposed to take care of take care. Yeah. it. It's not possible. It's not. <laughs> I agree. The the challenge for the seafarers. That's why the just transition task force yeah. is taking a sympathetic view on seafarers. That is where the probably the relief lies. That there is one body, and which is a fairly uh, recognized body. The people who are associated, their voices are being heard, and they are talking about seafarers as a key. Like, so they they all they are saying that start early so that the chaos doesn't come yes. they are anticipating there will be chaos that's why they're saying it is going to take 10 years right. it's going to take 10 years to really groom a seafarer to meet up with the requirements we are already in a way late so this is one body which is from the is Yeah, trying to take care of the seafarers. Yes, very interesting. Also, we will come down well down to that. I am not in the top, but in the safety part and running and all that. Bare minimum. That is what the I am not does. Bare minimum requirement is this, and after that, all the technical matters are concerned. It will finally go to the classification. Classification. There is no other way. The classification is one who is actually qualified for checking into the verification, running of the system, the technical system. Right. Technically, they are qualified. Because they will be the type they of approval certificates, so equipment, etc. Yes. So yes. that is where uh, the challenge has been there from very beginning. Any new thing that comes up, the class finally takes over because they have their research wing and everything. So class has has got a major role to play, no doubt about it. I think to Shambhal Raja asked about ships with an open for storage and all that. Certificate is valid for us mm. for LPG or LNG or any type of trade risk goods. Correct, correct. For LPG, if there is a specific task to be carried out by them, I think in-house training will be important. 
so it cannot be like kept away from that people have to learn talk about it should become top of the down kind of thing everybody is talking about now all the people so it has to become part of company so is there any dg uh, initiative to actually push for that or something or but our center of will be you know left behind uh, for to interfere with and see uh, we have training centers in china also the chinese government is uh, investing a lot in towards the regard Yeah. Or alternative through training. Yeah. So from our side, we will be left behind. And we will be lagging. Uh, yeah. And last minute rush will make you know the quality of training will also be an issue. So you have highlighted something which is very relevant. And uh, and we are people who are responsible for. It. And then we only can uh, think. Then right here, this is the only. Yeah, that's it. So we 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 cannot exclude ourselves that somebody else will do. We only will have to do. We only have to think. As you have rightly pointed out, China is moving ahead of the world. They have put an info paper also in the last yeah, ten. Really. You have read it, and the same way we should be coming up with papers, our paper proposals, which will eventually become the part of the regulatory requirement framework or guidelines for us. Okay, now I think we have some online questions. We'll come back again to the classroom here. Captain Pradhan, can you please? Just one by one and see. There is one question here which says: First of all, there seems to be no consensus on the type of alternate fuel, even among the technical experts. Rather, there is a no one fuel which has been honed on to. So, how can there be a tangible training program established? Thank you. 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 Thank you.
it would have been more appreciated if you could have given a cost analysis like all these type of fuels, which is the advantage with cost. Yeah. Because if you understand the <coughs> dangers of implementing some processes yeah. and then training them up and then you find this uh, something oh, else is better. Yeah. The commercial side of it. Uh, commercial side of it. So Clarkson and other bodies are working on that and their reports could have been part of my presentation and you write it could yeah. but then i didn't want to go on commercial side because we were discussing the outcome of stw 10 which happened where there was absolutely no discussion on no, you given the presentation uh, clear about the you know the positives and negatives of each of those options which are available so that he has got, but that actual cost part. Cost part. Uh, yeah. I have seen the presentation. Yeah. I have seen the presentation. Right. About the uh, cost comparison. Not about. cost comparison, about the variable uh, fuels. Yeah. Various fuels that are. Uh, no, cost comparison we have not seen. No, no. 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 It's very difficult. Right. This cost change. comparison was not there in here. That's why. Yeah. Sir. Your thoughts are like, it's very yes, relevant. Yes, all yes, the yes, world. Yes, from the next question. Yeah. This is not a question, it's a comment from Captain Shahid. Yeah. He said India needs to submit more papers yeah. as soon as possible in consultation with those likely to be affected. Right. So stakeholders need to be made aware of what's going to come and what's going to impact billion at once. Definitely, definitely. So, so yeah. all these bodies like IMEI, CMMI, DG itself, all, all these bodies are now getting together. Actually, SATO, SATO committee meetings are happening very much more often. And we are always in fo focus is there that we should be putting up papers of our own. The efforts are on. Soon we'll see better uh, outcome. Okay. Nothing more? Okay. Can I ask a question, please? Yeah. Captain Vivekanand. Yeah. Uh, Captain Arvind Natarajan, if he's here. Or Captain Mahesh Yadav. Uh, yes, sir. Please go ahead. We will answer one of us. You may be aware that presently in 2024, a strong case is being made out in Europe for the installation of compact nuclear reactors called small module reactors or SLRs on board cargo ships. All of a sudden, nuclear energy seems to have become a safe option for powering cargo ships. Apparently, it is simply because it produces zero emissions and also because a study suggested that putting two 30 megawatt lead-cooled reactors on one of the largest container vessels would increase cargo capacity and speed and eliminate the need for refueling for the next 25 years. There has been only one nuclear power ship, which was the Savannah. It was uh, in service for about eight years, 1962 to 1970. During his first year at sea, the ship dumped 115,000 gallons of radioactive waste into the ocean. Expensive to run, the vessel carried passengers for three years and cargo alone for another five years before it was defueled and berthed at Baltimore in 1970. Now, certainly, the current level of training of ship's officers, both nautical and marine engineering, as required by the HCC Convention, will not be adequate to enable them to safely operate and maintain nuclear-powered cargo ships. My question is, is IMO seized of this move coming from Europe to push nuclear-powered merchant ships? Please. <laughs> The Captain Arvind that is there? I don't know. Because he's in UK. I see it's UK, so he should be knowing about this. It is being spearheaded by a company called Core Power UK. Anywhere, but uh, uh, doesn't matter. I think uh, as you have the possibility of that uh, 11 different fuels that the Mr. Sonal Kumar listed, this is very much in the news uh, that yes, the proposals are on uh, about operating the cargo ships using the uh, nuclear fuel because uh, 
they say it is efficient and uh, you don't require uh, this thing. But then, of course, all aspects have to be weighed. Yes. It's not only the uh, the safety and the, this thing and the disposal. All aspects have to be weighed. And once that comes in, in that case, probably if it is good, let, let's accept it that it is good. If it is not good, it is not the, you know, the pros and cons have to be weighed too before taking any decision whether it is to be permitted or not to be permitted. Right. We read about this. We read about this about that uh, yeah. you know mm -hmm. that uh, nuclear fuel to be used on the cargo ships or uh, on the merchant ships in particular. You have seen it's five more greater. Yes, it is. Um, it so is. The, uh, the eleven grades of fuel which I know is focused on one of them is nuclear fuel. One of them. Yes, so, so it is very much there. In that is it very much. Yes. Could we have the twenty-two points and be sent across so we know uh, what happened actually? Okay. We cannot read it. That can be shared. That can be, 22 points can be shared. Please. Come from uh, Nandu Kumar Subramatin. No. Uh, we are asking, has there been any trials using these alternate fields, taking all the factors like design, storage, and risk into consideration on a full scale? Yeah. So, uh, yes, there have been trials on multiple fuel grades. In fact, in my last uh, presentation, we were on um, 11. Uh, grades were discussed. Uh, we spoke about the percentage. I mean, this uh, in today's presentation also, if you see the order book, uh, some of the things have been done in a simulator based trial. So, not full fledged trial, but yes, simulator based trials have been done. The biofuel grade, we have done our trials. So, there have been trials going on, and uh, soon we'll see the outcome. Uh, this is all in like working progress. We can conclude right now at this moment. Thank you. That's all I can see. Most of others are only comments. No question. Any final questions from the audience here? Yes, sir. So, uh, yeah. You also spoke about when we spoke about digitalization. So what kind of uh, like an app based system where you have a or like digital offer where you have uh, Indian stuff? Will be something similar on a worldwide basis, or what kind of determination are you doing? Yeah, that is on worldwide basis. Uh, the description that you have given it will be on worldwide basis, being centralized at IMO for all member states uh, or for all other stakeholders, including employers, to access direct. So like that is what is the problem because for doing anything and everything, you need to keep searching around in various places. So that will be the central place which will provide all the information to the member states, to the employers, or anybody else who wants to check or <laughs> derive various information which is required to be given by member states to IMO and that will be made up in a simple format which you can directly simply access. That is the attention. And also for CFLS documentation also, uh, are they going for digitalization or will it be again carrying the digital uh, uh, that uh, digitalization part is there about the digital certificates that has already been passed. <laughs> but as it's see, we are when we say 173 countries, <laughs> some of them are here, some of them are here. So <coughs> anything that is put in place, it has to be such which can be adopted by the countries at the top of the list or at the bottom of the list. You cannot mandate digitalization or digitalization of certificates. At the same time, you can give an option if you want to use it, please go ahead. And they are equally acceptable for all purposes. But to say that, you know, every country will have to issue the certificates and then you will have another 85 countries coming up and saying we cannot do it. I come in and ask a question, please. My name is Ramji Krishna. Yes. Yeah, thank you uh, for letting me ask the question. And uh, my question is simple, like, uh, what are the topics are we going to submit papers on to IMO, please? Is it possible to share that? Yeah. Uh, other than alternate fields, I can uh, uh, give you a sort of a gist of the various other topics. Since the date for submission of the papers right now, uh, will be sometime uh, around first week or fourth November actually it is and during that period uh, right now our uh, uh, <clears throat> you know the what has been provided for in phase one that is identification of topics which need revision 
we are not giving the what it should be revised to. First, that particular item has to be accepted that it needs revision. So we will be submitting paper regarding uh, which all are the items which need to be revised. And based on that, we will be submitting papers only for the purpose, but not providing what it should be revised to. And what we will be submitting will contain generally all the things that we talk about, uh, uh, outdated training requirements and consistencies in the convention itself, where the regulation speaks something else. There is some summary table provided that speaks something else. Uh, something in the A code is giving. So when you look at various aspects, there are several, several areas which uh, are there available, which are, you can say, if we just start preparing a list, it will take about 15, 20 days, maybe, or uh, depends on the cooperation from the various other stakeholders as well. But uh, it is not such a difficult job to say that we should be submitting papers. Yes, we will be submitting papers and we'll be submitting papers on all those items which need revision. And why do they re need revision? Because that phase two will take care of the other part of it, what it has to be revised to. So, yes, thank you. Thank you. Is it also possible for some of them or quite obvious? For example, celestial navigation, is it possible to take out this much earlier than till the new STC will come comes in in say 2028 or whatever? Uh, I don't think as a uh, no, I'm just asking as an interim because, yeah, because sure. it is, I mean, it is nearly another four or five years before it kicks in and after that another maybe one, two years for it to yeah, be implemented, etc, yeah. etc. Et so it is another five, six years okay. from today. Let me, let me, let me give you a try and give you an answer for that. As a manpower supplying country, I don't think we are in a position to take out anything out of the curriculum unless it has been taken out from the STC group. Whatever is existing in the STC rule convention, we will have to comply with that because we can't be on the wrong side of thing that the people getting the certificates from this country are not qualified in the competencies or the requirements which are laid down in the convention. We cannot afford to do that. I mean, we'll be risking the, you can say, the compliance standards of our certificates if we try to do that. If it takes 2027, 28, whatever year, okay, after that, if that is taken out, once again, I'm telling you that is there is a big if. If the circumstances continue to be the way they are in today's date, uh, in uh, uh, particularly in the eastern part of the hemisphere, I don't want to go any further details into it. In that case, it may possibly be become very difficult to take out many of the things that we desire them to be taken out. So obviously, that means we are still going to struggle before we get to even 2028 for all these things, if I understand so you correctly. See, anything yeah. to be deleted, taken out, has to be put under debate at the IMO, and then it has to be accepted by majority. Now, unless that happens, you can't take out anything from the convention. And if it has not been taken out from the convention, you cannot take out from Indian curriculum. You can only add anything, whatever you wish, but you cannot delete anything out of it. No, I didn't mean in Indian curriculum. I'm sorry, I didn't explain that. I thought there could be an interim thing. Anyway, you explained it. Thank you. Uh, interim, what is provided for uh, in parallel is only alternate okay. fuel. There's nothing else which has been provided for in the interim or fast track or priority one. The only item that has been provided for is uh, this alternate fuel as a separate in parallel priority item. Nothing else. It's an addition. Yeah, it's an addition. Yeah, no, not a deletion. Thank you. Yeah. Anything else? Okay. I think with that, uh, I return to the CEO. Uh, thank, uh, thank you very much, uh, <laughs> sir. <laughs> A splendid job by <laughs> Captain Mahesh Yadav and the panelists, uh, which includes uh, CL Dubey, Arvind Natrajan, and Sunil Kumar. I will now uh, invite uh, Captain Bandarkar to hand over the memorabilia and take it forward after the vote of thanks from here. Yeah, it gives me great pleasure to be here and to see such uh, well-known faces <laughs> who have delivered such high level of papers in the past. Uh, I would like to, on behalf of the chairman, CMMI office bearers, respected models, senior CMMI members, of the shipping fraternity and all the participants, 
It is my privilege to propose a vote of thanks. I'd like to thank the panelists, Captain C. L. Dubey, fellow and warden, Captain uh, Arvind Natarajan, CMMI member, AFNI, <laughs> Sunil Kumar, IMEI, and head of training and assessment, JESCO, for updating us on the HTC, HTW 10. While it is a need of the hour for India to come out with more papers, you know, when people go out to IMO, they have to put in a lot of uh, effort, they have to get a lot of documents from here and there to get such uh, information. It is my humble request that companies like Great Eastern and many other shipping companies should fund people like who know this sort of information, how to collect it and present it to IMO. Without such uh, money coming in for these people, for the research, it will be very difficult for India to produce high level of papers. So it is our, uh, while we are sitting here, I think this is a guide, good forum to reach out to the industry to come forward with some funding. And India has got a wealth of knowledge. I have some sitting right here. Uh, Captain Mahesh Yadha, so many, I am just don't want to name anybody, but uh, I'll move ahead. I would like to thank Captain Mahesh Yadav for moderating the session. I would like to thank the media covering the event. Special thanks once again to Captain Nangya for Sailor Today, YouTube. Captain Sashi Kumar, CEO, Sudhir Palkar, Mr. Kumar for organizing the meeting. Finally, we thank every participant without whom today's lecture meeting would not have been possible. Thank you all. I would now like to thank Captain Dubey and MMPI for hosting today's CMMI lecture meeting. And uh, can I invite Captain Y. Sharma, Yankee sir, to give a token of respect and thank you to Captain Dubey. Yeah, so he has to give the speaker. He went here. That I am May I invite Captain Subeda to come and uh, Ms. Captain Arvin Natarajan is not here. Uh, so, if uh, Captain Dubey, can you please uh, take for, on behalf of uh, Captain Natarajan and we can send it to the desk? This is for Captain Natarajan. So, could you please stay here for a minute? Captain Kasu Pradhan, can you please come? This uh, for Mr. Sunil Kumar, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, there is a special uh, give, uh, presentation to you also. Uh, Man, uh, this uh, Manix has brought some gifts. Where is that? Afterward. After annual function. Huh. MTG, MTG. Okay, okay. So I expect it to be that. All right. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Captain Yadav, where is that? No, no, no. That's all. That's all. Thank you, Captain Yadav. Thank you, Captain Yadav. Yeah, 
In our life, in my lifetime, this SCCW matter is happening both times. Happened to be a small training learning in early 70s, 73, 74, 77 in England. When under the then chairman of the committee of INCO, Captain Gurishar and Singh. Mr. C.P. Shrivastava, first Indian chairman or secretary general of INCO, was tasked to bring the world together on a common platform of a fair minimum requirement, which that time was only 57 to 58 countries. And Captain Gurusharan Singh, head of nautical at INCO, deputed from India, of course. He was DG uh, NA when I joined the government. Almost cut copy what was the United Kingdom or the Commonwealth requirement of training of seafarers. And it was the task of Mr. C. P. Shivastava to let the rest of the world, English speaking, non-English speaking, to take that system on board. India lucked out because we were following that anyway. Come 78, it took about another four years to implement. 2082, it became part of the global environment. In 1995, I happened to be again in England, two years in IMO, two years at the NCGA, what was called the Regional Organization, or the equivalent of DG shipping in India. I took active part in, I got the opportunity to take active part in comprehensive revision at that time for 78 to 95. So the subjectivity which was there in 78 and the bare minimum that was required to be done by all 57 countries now had come to 100 odd countries and objectivity was missing and that was felt quite rightly by Many stakeholders like we are sitting here, the last stakeholder, including National Maritime Board, ICS at that time, MNTB, complete, uh, Honorable Company of Master Mariners, everybody pitched in. Lots of committees were made to bring in. That's where the competency table idea came and Code A and Code B was born. We had 95 for about 15 years and 2010, we found another comprehensive region too. Most of 95, other than the tweaking in which India took quite a lot of uh, inputs or gave a lot of inputs to the extent that Mahesh Yadav would bear me out, I was also there at that time, that if we had done our homework properly and had support of Delhi, it could have become Bombay amendments rather than Manila amendments. This time, I am seeing again for the fourth time now, the word comprehensive revision is being used. And we heard this now, and some of you have perhaps seen my uh, post, and I have written to many other people of like minded across the globe and I can see both UK, ICS 
and EU and HTW10, thanks to the delegation which whichever was for there, they're at least now talking their articles need to be revisited. I've been saying this for a long time. But what was done in 78 was the bare minimum which we had to take everybody on board. You cannot have mandatory, like you said, some are there, some are here. You can't everybody to do like this. So it remains there, it remains here. But we are now at 50, 60 years of this experience. There is time to make the new HTCW and therefore the word going forward, although is being used as comprehensive revision, our papers, I hope, should start talking about new HTCW rather than comprehensive revision. Because if articles is now on board, which was not there in HTW 6, 7, 9, it is there on HTW 10, one of the 22 points. An article's change would make a mandate necessary. Without that mandate, we cannot have a stronger and uniformly applied SCCW across 173 countries. Everybody is on board now. We need to push that we need to change few articles, standard regulations, Relook at all code B, far too big code B. Some of it needs to come to code A. Code A needs to have more strength, including competence tables. What can selection language coming, not coming, not going? Take, for example, QSS. Most senior people, oldies as we call, are saying 12 months, including six months of watch keeping, is not good enough. But nobody is putting up a paper to say, then let's go back to 27 months, 36 months. When is that day going to come? I request Captain Dube to, uh, oh, he, he attended uh, online. Uh, Sunil, you attended in person. I believe HTW10, you have talk, talked about the template, which is getting really refined and all that. When it comes from Sunil, uh, from Natarajan later on, or he will come to know. But whatever little template that may have come, I would request this, that this template of proposals be circulated amongst all of us so that we know how that proposal is to be put forward in the first place. The template, I believe, is part of the HTW10 report. I requested CMMI to have that report handy so that we could have a look at it. It is not here, but that template is very important. And the template that is going to come or getting refined as we speak, I think it, all stakeholders need to have that template so that we can write or develop our proposal from those lines before 4th of November. I undertook. This is the one you have to. Yeah, whatever was the template. There was a template idea. Yeah, it is. <clears throat> Ashok Mahapatra, who happens to be in India now, I have. On my own initiative, done a small questionnaire survey, got a fairly good response. A similar survey was done in the United Kingdom, and that's where I got the cue from. There are only 60 responses across the United Kingdom. India is a rather large subcontinent. I got 527. Some of them are maybe no less. But I got good 527, which I've analyzed. I put forward and shared with many of you. The results of the first analysis, I was supposed to have done second analysis, but my uh, chart is not yet ready, so I will share it again. It is very clearly coming out, and many of the responses are from seafarers, sailing seafarers and masters. Now, when, when I told Ashok Mahapatra, Ashok Mahapatra tells me that nobody listens to seafarers at the IMO and the administration, which is not right. If that is a survey kind of thing, or that is a random sample that is coming out, that sea service is not good enough. So a proposal must be put in that template that sea service needs to be looked at. Like May said, how to do it is a phase two. But proposal must go that sea service of 12 months, including six months, what we think is not good enough. This is a proposal that must go. Definition of a party, definition of administration, is being played with each other. Kabi party bolte hai, to wo nahi bolta hai. Kabi admission bolte hai, to wo nahi bolta hai. 
let's all come on the same page so that we, we are on administrations and parties together. Nobody is outside the scope of it. And uniform implementation will only come if the articles are stringent. And with the technology kind of thing going forward, there is a need that articles should provide for real-time change to be implemented. That cannot come with the present articles. And therefore, article really look is very important. And I hope that we all will help the Indian delegation before the fourth of November to put forward the proposals as prescribed in the template way. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, sir. Thank you very much for enlightening us your thoughts. Please. So, uh, if there is nothing else, uh, uh, we will close the online and uh, you know uh, uh, meeting now, and we will leave the meeting. Thank you, every. Thank you very much to those who have attended in person and also oh, online. Uh, thank you, gentlemen. Uh, we have arranged the refreshment in the adjacent room. Uh, you are requested to be join us. Everything is finished. Yes, sir. Yes, sir.